Uh, we're honored to have Mary Barra here as our special guest. Mary um, has been the CEO of General Motors for 10 years, the chairman and, and CEO for eight years. She became chairman uh, two years after she became uh, the CEO. And uh, she's also, she's a native of Michigan. Her father worked at General Motors, I guess, for 40 years. Almost, yeah. Just 40 years. And she uh, did her undergraduate work at what was then called the General Motors Institute, now called Kettering University. She then got a scholarship to go to Stanford Business School, where she got her MBA. She's the chair of the Business Roundtable now. And even more importantly, she's a member of the Board of Trustees of Duke University, uh, where her two children uh, went to college. So, Mary, thank you very much for coming. So, uh, let's talk about electric vehicles. Um, is that the future of all the automobile world in 25 years from now? Will there be any internal combustion engines floating around that people are going to buy, or everything's going to be electric? I, I believe in 25 years it'll all be electric or hydrogen fuel cells, uh, but it will be emissions free. Yes. Okay, so, right now, um, the largest seller of electric cars, electric vehicles in the United States is Tesla. How did Tesla get to be such a big uh, uh, manufacturer of these kind of cars when it started from scratch and General Motors and Ford and Chrysler were around for such a long time? Did, did, he, did uh, Elon Musk know something that ever, the others didn't know or did, he, did big companies just didn't take electric vehicles seriously enough? Well, I think uh, General Motors has always taken electric vehicles very seriously. I mean, you know, 20, 20 plus years ago, we had EV1. So in a certain sense, I think we were a little ahead of our time from a technology perspective, but we never stopped working on EVs. We had uh, the Volt extended range electric vehicle. Then we had the Bolt that came out, you know, in 2015. So, but I do have to give uh, Tesla a lot of credit uh, because I think they've really, they stayed committed and kept, you know, they, they had to work through the years of getting to scale and growing. And I, um, I think they've really, helped uh, the EV market. I think now there's a lot of uh, OEMs. We have, you know, I think competition to Tesla. So I think it's going to change the dynamics. So right now, um, the biggest manufacturer of automobiles in the United States, that's sold in the United States, is that General Motors? Are yes. you the biggest? We sell more vehicles than anyone else here. And so in a given year, the total amount of cars bought in the United States, how much is that now? Well, total amount uh, this year will probably be around 16 million. 16 million. Mm -hmm. And you sell how many cars a 16 year? 16 to 17 percent. Um, globally, we sell nearly six six million, uh, and this is our biggest market. And so, you know, we'll, we're on track right now to, to to continue to you know be a lead in 16 to 17 percent. Okay. So, when people um, buy cars these days, when I used to buy cars, I haven't bought a you car. Need to buy a car. Yeah, you know, about 20 years. But uh, <laughs> but I when I used to buy cars, they used to have sedans and things like that. Now, nobody seems to buy them. Everything, you're, you're the biggest seller of, of SUVs in the United States and your second biggest is light trucks. So sedans are just not that popular. Why are they not so popular anymore? Well, I think w when people buy sedans, you're either buying a performance vehicle uh, or you're buying a, a luxury vehicle. But generally, once people sit in a, in a crossover or a truck or an SUV, you're, you just got a higher stance. It gives you better visibility of the road and people like that. It's better command of the road. Hey, so what do you drive? Uh, well, one of the best parts of my job is I get to drive a lot of things. So um, I'm driving a Hummer. Uh, I'm Hummer. Hummer EV, um, which is a lot of fun. You get respect driving a Hummer EV. <laughs> um, I'm also driving a Blazer. Um, I can't wait. Shortly, I want to get into our, we have, we'll be launching it next year is an EV Equinox, which is great. By the way, if you didn't catch it, the Blazers outside in the front, it's a Blazer EV, which was Motor Trends uh, SUV of the year. So please check it out. Uh, but yeah, that's one of the benefits. I, I get to switch in and out of cars okay. and drive a lot. Now, recently there was a movie that had a car. I don't know if you make this car for, I have a picture of a hero model. It's a, it's a Barbie um, Corvette. Um, and um, do you actually make the pink Corvettes or not so much? We don't actually make a pink Corvette. We still make Corvettes. And by the way, I had a Barbie uh, oh. Corvette when I was growing up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Not pink. It was yellow. Pink. So uh, today, are you worried about foreign competition more than you are about domestic competition in terms of being a leader in the automobile manufacturing world? Do you think that uh, the Chinese are going to be sending more cars over or because of the um, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, it's unlikely the Chinese can, can ship that many cars over here? Well, you know, first of all, I take every single competitor seriously, whether it's a startup, whether it's a, an incumbent, uh, I take them all very seriously. I think uh, you, 
if you don't, you do that at your own peril. Uh, I think there's a, this has always been a competitive industry. I think it's becoming more competitive, but I mean, the, it's, it also is a fashion industry. I mean, people, you know, identify with the car they, they buy. I mean, I, I, I get letters every week from people, many of them name their vehicle. And uh, so it's, it's a really exciting business. I think, you know, when you look at broader, um, you've always got to remain cost competitive no matter where, but I think what we need to look at, since we're in DC, we need to make sure there's a level playing field uh, in, in, in all the countries in which people want to sell in this country. So you're in Washington DC in part because of Business Roundtable, which you're the chair of. Uh, the Business Roundtable is a group of CEOs that are, I think are uh, lobbying for various things they might want. What is the biggest thing on the agenda of the business roundtable these days? Well, I think uh, you know, general the, the business roundtable is is working to have economic growth in the U.S. to to provide better, uh, opportunities for uh, the workforce here in America. So, you know, I think I'm really proud of a lot of the uh, things. You know, it, whether it's the Chips Act, whether it was the infrastructure bill, there's a lot of things that are going to be good for the country uh, and and good for business as well. But one of the things I think I'm most proud of what BRT is doing is what they're doing. The member companies are doing around workforce development. Uh, across uh, many different elements to, to, again, to really encourage the workforce development in the United States. So that's probably what I'm most proud of. Well, speaking about workers, uh, you and your um, co-CEOs of automobile companies agreed to a union um, agreement that I think for the next X number of years said by some outside commentators to add $10 billion or so in labor costs. I'm not sure if that's the right number. Uh, you can tell me what the right number is, but uh, is that going to fuel inflation or is it just uh, something that you expected to pay? It just took a little while for a strike to kind of get you to pay it. <laughs> uh, I never wanted a strike. Um, I always want to work constructively with our union partners to get to the right answer. But you know, when I, but for General Motors specifically, we have stated that the, the agreement is going to be between uh, $500 to $575 more a vehicle, but we plan on offsetting that. As we looked at the labor environment, and you know, when you looked at whether it was John Deere or Caterpillar or UPS, you, know, you saw what, um, you know, what the trends were with what was happening in labor agreements. But let's step back and think about you know, our agreements with the UAW. This current one is 4.75 years. The past was four. Think about what happened over the past four years. COVID, semiconductor shortages, our manufacturing represented workers and our manufacturing team in general did a phenomenal job. They were back to work uh, when most people were still figuring out what COVID stood for. And you know, without them, we wouldn't have built vehicles, we wouldn't exist. So we wanted to recognize our workforce. Then they went into the ups and downs of semiconductor shortages, supply chain. So our manufacturing team has done a phenomenal job and we wanted to reward them. Right. So many uh, foreign automobile manufacturers have built facilities in this country in right to work states, and they, they tend not to be unionized. You have a unionized workforce. How do you compete on a cost basis with cars that are produced at a non unionized uh, factory? How do you do that? Well, I think we drive efficiency and I'm really, again, proud of our manufacturing team. For the last two years, we've had the highest uh, quality. We have high customer loyalty. You know, we work to drive efficiency, so we offset the cost differential and we'll continue to do that. And I think if you look, a lot of the non-represented um, uh, OEMs are now uh, raising, raising their rates to match what we did. So since you've been the CEO, the uh, earnings of the company have more than doubled, I believe. So you've, you're earning this year roughly ten billion dollars a year, or something like that, or you're. I haven't. We haven't put that out there, but oh, we're going to have a. We're going to have a good year. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So it's a very profitable. And when you inherited it, you you kind of came uh, after a period of time when GM had been in bankruptcy. Um, today, your biggest challenge is what? Is it foreign competition, U.S. government regulation, workers, interviewers? What is your biggest challenge? <laughs> I mean, I would say I, I'm super excited about the business. I think next year we had some uh, manufacturing challenges this year uh, that caused us to not get as many EVs on the road as we want. But I think you know, next year when I look at the strength of our portfolio, uh, we've had a very successful year with both our internal combustion engine vehicles and, and EV vehicles. Uh, consumers want to buy them. I mean, we we have wait lists. We've been able to keep our incentives low. So, you know, I, I feel really good about the product portfolio we have going forward. So for me what I'm focused on is execution. When people want to buy a car today, do they typically do it over the internet or do they actually go into dealers? So 
uh, you know, right now at General Motors, you can do the whole transaction online and a dealer will, you know, in many cases, most cases, uh, deliver the vehicle to you. Generally, people do most of their research on, online and then they, but most people still want to go to the dealer, kick the tires, see the vehicle, uh, except drive it if they want, but it has changed. In, you know, 10 years ago, people would go to three to four dealers. Now they're going to maybe one because they go in and they know what they're looking for. And generally from the internet, they know that vehicle's there. So um, the old days used to negotiate price and the, the salesman said, let me go talk to my manager, see whether I give you a discount, <laughs> so forth. And I don't know what they did in the back room, but um, so today everybody knows the price of everything. So a dealer, you have a suggested retail price typically, and the discount that a customer who's reasonably informed should be able to get, is that a 5% discount or 2% or what kind of discount off the retail price are they supposed to get or did they typically get? I think dealers, at least I'll talk about GM dealers, I think they get a bad rep because our dealers are great. They work hard to, to you know, get the customer in, educate them about the vehicles, you know, find the right deal. Congratulations to one of our dealers right here. Uh, you know, so I think our dealers do a great job of helping the customer navigate. You know, this, it's a big purchase for most people. Uh, getting the right vehicle is is uh, in understanding what options you want. So I think they do a, a great job. And you know, a lot now uh, is is defined. Uh, and and again, the dealer helps the uh, the customer yeah. navigate through that. But everybody feels when you're buying a car, you should negotiate a little bit. Do people not negotiate so much anymore? They know what the prices are online, or they say, "Give me a standard discount or something." It depends on what's happening um, across the the broader industry. Because again, our dealers do have the right to set the final price. That's you know dealer franchise laws across the con uh, across the country. But I would say the bulk of our dealers uh, follow uh, the manufacturer manufacturer suggested retail price, along with uh, incentives if there are any are on okay. the vehicle. In the old days, I when used to buy cars. Uh, and you need to go back. I need to buy another one now. <laughs> but um, used to, like you go in, you say, I want this color and I want this option and that option. And they say, well, manufacture it for you. It'll take you a month or two. Now everything is already made pretty much. Is that right? Or Well, I think we're seeing a shift right now because through COVID, uh, when uh, you know we were short and for the last couple of years, there's been, we haven't been able to supply as many vehicles as the consumer wants. But I think we've learned to be much more efficient. So instead of a dealer having, you know, hundreds of cars on their showroom. Uh, for our EVs, for example, we're gonna have regional areas where and we're also uh, you know, really using data analytics to understand what does the customer really want, that they can get it quickly. A lot of people still go to the dealership and drive, drive off, but I think we're, we're changing that to be more efficient um, for, for the business, for the dealer, uh, and the customer still gets what they want in a matter of days. So when people come to buy a car, are they mostly financing these cars or are people today just plunking down cash? Most people finance. Financing. Most people, yeah. And are you provide financing these days? We or? do. We have a, a, a finance company called GM Financial uh, that uh, does a very nice job uh, taking care of the customer. Okay. So the theory behind electric vehicles is that they're more environmentally friendly. And when the automobile industry first started, all cars were electric in the very beginning of the industry. Um, then they're, when the internal combustion engine came along, the electric cars were called women's cars because they were thought to be slow. And so people love the faster internal combustion engine. But the, the point I wanted to ask you about is, are electric vehicles really that environmentally friendly? Because you have to get precious metals out of the ground that takes some you know, pollution or so forth. Is there, is there a measurement that says EVs are much better for the environment by X percent than internal combustion engines, or is no way to measure how much better they are? Well, I think there's been studies where people attempt to, but I think it's all the individual, I mean, are, are we mining uh, sustainably? Are we building the vehicles uh, sustainably? I mean, GM has set carbon neutral goals for 2040. Uh, already we uh, operate um, almost all of our facilities around the globe with zero waste. And so there's so much of renewable energy. We have goals set for all of that. And then, you know, working to make sure the supply chain follows that as well. So it's a journey that we're on. And I think, you know, we will be to a better place from a climate perspective as all these initiatives take place. Okay, so a number of years ago, when COVID happened, there was a big concern about the supply chain and so forth. And it was said that the semiconductor manufacturing, often in Taiwan or elsewhere, was backed up. Uh, that problem is now going away, right? You have the semiconductors you need for cars? Mostly, yes. And most of the cars um, that you produce have enormous amount of semiconductors. I can't remember, is it 1,000 or 500 or something? But all of your cars, electric and non-electric, all have enormous amount of semiconductors. Is that 
standard? It, that's true. And you know, I think the semiconductor was eye-opening for a lot of OEMs because mostly um, our, our suppliers were the ones who purchased and they came as part of you know, a part or a sub-assembly. What, what General Motors has done is we've adopted three families of semiconductors that will then direct and we'll, this will start um, in vehicles you know, 20, in the 26 timeframe. So we'll have much more control, much more commonality. That scale should give us price advantages as well. Okay, so when people go to buy a car today, um, are they, what's the most popular color? White. White. That get dirty, doesn't it? But they don't care about that. People love white cars. This, and this is true for the US, it's true for China as well. Really? White is the number one color right. for vehicles. Um, the, I always thought that you could, when you went in, you would buy a car for a certain price, but the salesman or saleswoman would say, we have these options. You could get this, you get this, you get this. Are any more options available? Or everything is now with all the options? No, I mean, we still, one of the things we've done though is try to not have so many different options and trim levels that the consumer gets confused. So we've standardized, helps with inventory management, helps across the board. But I mean, people still do like, again, this is an important purchase. Think about it. For most people, this is the most important or the second most important mm -hmm. purchase they make. And so they want it to meet their needs. They want to customize it. We like when they customize it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's something that they personalize. Who, when, when, when a couple, a man and a woman, let's say, come in to buy a car, who is the decision maker, really, if you found? Generally, it's the, it's, generally it's the woman. Woman. And so if, the, if a man comes in and says, I want to buy this car, and I'm going to negotiate to buy it, do the salespeople say, well, bring your partner or your spouse back because that's the decision maker, or they, they will negotiate with the man? I think they try to respect the consumer who's there okay. and, and negotiate with that individual. Okay. So the average price of a car today, I, I don't know, but of the average car price that, you, let's say, a General Motors sells, is it 50000 60000 40000 What's the average price? Well, because we sell so many trucks, our average okay. transaction prices are probably, I think right now, I haven't checked recently, in the high, in the high 40s. Okay. Uh, but we also have very affordable vehicles. Um, you know, we have a Chevy Trax that starts under $20,000. Okay. And there used to be a, a thing that I used to buy when I didn't know much about car buying. Um, called rust proofing. Have you ever heard of that? That was, they always said at the end, you gotta rust proof the bottom of the car, it'll rust. I said, why, why is it gonna rust? I mean, but I always bought it and never rusted, but do they have that anymore? <laughs> They don't. Well, generally, the way we build the vehicles right now, they, um, they you know, there, there's under, there's treatments. Um, there may be some things that the deal sells for certain right. regions of the company, but it's probably good that you bought it at the time. Again, I just please go to buy a dealer, okay. go to a dealership and buy. So it. when I was, I was actually driving home last night for, uh, in an old car that I have, and um, the gas light was kind of blinking on and off, like it was going to run out of gas, and I didn't have time to go get another more gas, but. How much extra gas do you have? <laughs> because I don't know, when it gets to it's like blinking, blinking, do you still have 10 miles, 20 miles? I never know. Well, how long has it been blinking is the question. <laughs> it's blinking because for about 10 will, minutes, so I, that, I, I got nervous. That's probably problematic. Uh, okay, um, all right. But okay, it, it depends on the model, but you know, generally, I, I would say you have you know, probably 30, 40 miles when it's starting to say, you know, okay, okay. to say, we don't want you to be stranded. Right, so um, I always, my father didn't have a lot of money, and so when we got gasoline for the car, it was always the least expensive, it was regular, whatever his regular is, and so I've been trained to get regular. Is there an advantage to getting non-regular for cars that you make, or? I, there... Well, you really, in all seriousness, you really need to look at what the engine is rated for, um, and you need to follow that, because that's oh. going, if you put lower, uh, lower level of gas in an engine that performs right. better, it, it's not, it's not going to perform better. It's not good for the engine. So you should usually, when you open the fuel door, there's a little um, sticker there that tells oh. you what, what level you should put. All right, in. okay. So uh, what about, do you have a uh, ability to keep people from driving who are drunk? In other words, I think some cars, I don't know if you have them, where if the person is breathing like alcohol, the car won't start. Is that a standard thing anymore? That, that isn't, but actually, this has just been in the news this week. We've been working with regulators um, uh, on that, that what can we do to, to sense? So we have technology to do that, obviously, uh, you know, and we've actually piloted uh, with some fleets. So I think that's technology that's coming that I think is going to be good for everyone. I think that's probably a good if you can get it in, but I think the bigger problem today is, which I'm at fault is, is trying to drive while you're texting at the same time. That's, yeah, um, you shouldn't do that. How do you, how do you can prevent people from texting while they're driving? It's a, you know. Just... Well, I mean, I think it, 
frankly, when you look at um, distracted driving and the number of accidents that distractions, it's really hard to measure because you're kind of relying on right. somebody to say, hey, I was on my phone and I got into an accident, which generally people don't want to do. But uh, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is to allow people to use voice. So instead of looking down at your phone, uh, leveraging the systems in the vehicle that are connected to your phone to be able to call, to have an uh, email or a text read to you. So we are really working to improve the safety uh, to keep people with their eyes on the road. So recently you have reorganized, if that's the right word, your um, autonomous driving division. So how much longer is it before autonomous driving is a reality? Is that really 10 years away, not two or three years away? I don't think it's 10 years away. I think, uh, you know, with some of the challenges we just faced, I think it was more uh, not being, not working with the regulators to help them understand the technology and then being transparent as issues happen. But the technology had already been evaluated by a right. third party to say it's already safer than a human driver. I think, what, well, first of all, uh, on average, uh, people think, 85% of people think they're above average driver. So the math doesn't work. But because they think that, you know, they, well, you know, one of the, I think the big ahas for me is, is you need to be safer than a human driver, but frankly, for people to be comfortable with the technology, they've got to be even right. more safe. And so that's, uh, we'll, we'll work to achieve that, but I think it's, it's not that far away. Well, I'm not in that 85% because when I'm driving, I'm, people are always honking the horn at me. So I get the message that maybe I'm not such a great driver. Stop texting. Okay, yeah, I should stop texting. Um, <laughs> So why are people so obsessed with autonomous driving? Because one of the great passages of life is getting your driver's license and learning how to drive. But why do people seem so obsessed with having autonomous driving? Is it really that much demand for that? Well, I think, um First of all, I love to drive, and so I love to drive. But there's times, I think, when all of us, if we're in stop-and-go traffic, if we have something we need to do. Uh, uh, and the other thing is, right now, for about 40,000 people in the U.S. alone lose their lives uh, in traffic accidents, and over 90% of them are caused by human error. So if you can have a system right. that is better than a human being driving, it's, it's right. inherently safer, and it gives you back time. Right. Do airbags really work? I mean, they really, I haven't had an airbag fortunately yet, but do they really work and they save lives? They absolutely do, but I, a public safety message, seatbelt is your primary, you should right. always wear your seatbelt. That's your primary restraint system. An airbag is, it's even called a supplemental uh, restraint. So yes, they work, but it, it's important to wear your seatbelt all the time. Today in cars, uh, you have um, the, in the you, you can't, you get a buzzer in a car if you don't have your seatbelt on but you can still drive the car with the buzzer on. So is there some way to keep it so that if you don't have your seatbelt on, the car won't go, or that's unrealistic? We actually, actually on our vehicles right now, you, there's a setting where the car, you can't put the, it won't let, it, let you shift into gear without uh, having your seatbelt on. Uh, it's, right now it's customer choice. That's other technology. Again, we've done a lot of work with fleets to, and it's, it's, you're just safer. So I think that's, and I think this is something, you know, 20 years ago the industry did and it wasn't as good as it, as it is Thank now you. that it frustrated people. But uh, I think that technology works well and I encourage everyone to now, on your setting. Now when you're driving a car on weekends, you're driving a car, that's amazing. But do you ever test your competitors' cars and what do you think of them? I, I, I do uh, drive our competitor, competitive vehicles. I usually do it on, in our, uh, on our proving ground as opposed to out um, on public streets. But yes, I've done that. And which, which ones would you recommend if somebody said that <laughs> they, they didn't like General Motors, uh, but uh, you wouldn't recommend any of them? Right? I would ask them why they don't like General Motors because I'm pretty sure we have a vehicle for them. Okay. So um, the, your top line most expensive car, is that a Cadillac still or something? Cadillac Escalade and, and then some of the Corvettes. Uh, I, like, is there a big market still for expensive Cadillacs? I don't know. We can't make enough Cadillacs, or, uh, Escalades right now, so I think it's a very strong market. So in the old days, there were many different brands of General Motors, and I th you think you've gotten rid of some of them. So which ones are not around anymore? It's like Oldsmobile, is that not around? Oldsmobile, Pontiac, Saturn. Oh, they're gone. Yeah. Okay, and what are the, the brands now you have? So Cadillac is our luxury right. brand, Chevrolet is our volume brand, and then we have uh, Buick and GMC. Buick is primarily okay. crossover premium and a GMC is premium trucks. Okay. And you manufacture and sell a lot of cars in China, is that right? Uh, yes, we do with our two joint venture partners. Is that your biggest market or second biggest market? Well, we sell more vehicles in the US, I would say, and, and the, the Chinese market is shifting right now as it moves to electric and there's a, about 100 domestic EV okay. competitors, uh, but our, our, we sell more vehicles in this market and second is China. And what, you're out of Europe now? You've sold your Europe? We are just getting back into Europe. We oh, didn't are. sell our operations, but we're going back with either uh, luxury cars or electric cars.
Oh, why, why did you get out and then come back? Well, it, we um, had a, the Opal brand, right. and when we looked, we didn't have scale, and so we're going in with you know with the future of vehicles, you know, primarily EVs, but also some of the uh, iconic luxury or luxury vehicles that we have, whether it's Cadillacs, Corvettes, et cetera. Okay, and what about Latin America? Do you sell a lot down we sell, there? We're, most Latin American markets were number one or number two. And the Middle East? Uh, I don't know. I, I, we do sell a lot of vehicles in the Middle East. I, I don't know what position we are market-wise, but it's a very significant market for us. Okay, so many years ago, General Motors got into many different businesses. They bought EDS. They, were, they bought, uh, I think, uh, telecommunications companies and so forth. But you're basically going to stay in the business of manufacturing vehicles. You're not doing other things. Yeah, you know, when we look at our business, it's about vehicles and it's software because every vehicle really is a software platform now. And and then the, you know, what what can you do with technology to provide a better customer experience? And then the related businesses of, uh, we have a defense business leveraging the technology, whether it's electric, electrification, communication, or uh, autonomy or fuel cells. So recently the COP28 meeting occurred in Dubai. And uh, do you think that anything is really going to come out of COP28 such that we're really going to reduce the climate, uh, the, the temperature in this world for the next 100 years or so, or is it really unrealistic to think that something significant is going to happen? You know, I'm, I'm a glass three-quarter full person, so I'm hopeful. I mean, I think there was good discussions. I know we had our chief sustainability officer there, and there's a lot of discussions going on between companies, and I, I, think, there's, I think we will make advancements. Okay, so let's talk about your background for a moment. Uh, you grew up in what city? I grew up in Waterford, Michigan. And your father was a lathe operator? He was a dye maker. Dye maker. Yeah. Okay. And your mother, was she at She General, was a bookkeeper. At General Motors or not? No, nope, no. she worked okay. for a small company. Okay. And so did you say from the time you were a little girl, I want to work at General Motors or? No, not really. But I always liked math and science. And, you know, occasionally, very rarely, my dad would get to bring a new vehicle home. And it was, you know, again, it was exciting. So you went to a school called General Motors Institute, which now... Kettering University said, what was that? That designed to people to give you a free college education if you went there and then you would have to work at General Motors or not? Well, when I started, you actually had to, you co op So you went to school for three months, co opt and you had to find a, a sponsorship for a co op within General Motors. Midway through, they opened it up. Uh, but you, it was, uh, you could pay your own way uh, with, you know, because you were working half the year and it was a, a four and a half year program. All right, you, went, you must have done well. You got into Stanford Business School. So after Stanford Business School, do you say, well, I don't need to go back to General Motors. I, I can work anywhere. Go work at being a venture capitalist or private equity even, something good. So, um, <laughs> so did you ever consider those important professions or you said, no, I want to go back to General Motors? Well, first of all, General Motors uh, was generous enough to pay my way through business school. Okay. So I went back and I, I love the business. I mean, it's exciting business. Uh, you know, again, we get to be an important part of people's lives. I love vehicles. I mean, and I find that with a lot of people, if they leave the industry, they want to come back because it's, it's just exciting. And, you know, now when you look at it, we're going to change the way people move. It's, you know, we're going to make uh, better for the environment. So uh, it's, I'm passionate about it. Okay, so when so you... I missed out on private equity. Well, uh, it's not too late. Um, <laughs> never too late for private equity. So, um, so let me ask you, when you, when you went back there, did people say, you know, we've never had a woman CEO, but you're going to be the first woman CEO? Or do you even think that we're going to have a, a female CEO? No, I mean, really, it was maybe a year, year and a half before I was named that it was even something I thought was in the consideration set. Uh, so, I, you know, I just uh, always looked at General Motors and was given great opportunities throughout my career to learn new things, have a broadening experience, work in different areas. So I loved it. So do you have a lot of lunches or dinners with other female CEOs of automobile companies? Not a lot. Not really any. Um, there, are there any? No, there isn't right now, no. Oh, okay. Um, but any more? There, there are, but I, I would say there are women in other auto companies in very significant roles. Okay. Uh, so. Okay, so you've made uh, DEI a very important part of what you're doing. Uh, what have you done to change the, let's say, employee mix at uh, General Motors? Are there more women, minorities in the, in the senior parts or the other parts of the, of the company now? Well, you know, we very much believe in uh, having a diverse workforce, diverse, diverse views. So we do look at our representation. But, you know, really, when I look at our diversity, equity, inclusion efforts, uh, it's about making sure everybody feels welcome when they come to work, that they feel included. Uh, and, and that really happens at the local level because, you know, I can say something, but how does your local group? And one of the things I ask everyone to do is every day, 
you know, you have a choice. You can make the people that you're working with feel great, or you can make them feel not so great. You can make them feel not included. And that happens at a very personal one-on-one -on -one department by department area. So I encourage everybody, like you, that's a choice everyone can make. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't have tough, tough conversations or disagree about someone, but how do you make, if you make people feel welcome, it's gonna be a more inclusive environment. I think we're gonna get more done. I think we're gonna succeed. So if you're the CEO of General Motors, as you are, I assume you're a really big deal in the Detroit area. So can you go out to lunch or can you go shopping in a department store without people coming up with resumes or, or other things? Or how do you deal with it? You have big sunglasses or hats? What do you, what do, you do to how to hide from everybody uh, who wants something from you? You know, I would say, I, uh, you know, in, only in, in the local area, but not, you know, not, not everybody even reckon, a lot of people don't pay attention to business, but the people who do, I find them to be very respectful. So it comes with the territory. Okay, so when you meet, when you're the chair of the business roundtable, uh, do you ever meet these other CEOs and say, how did they become CEOs or you, you never, you never, you never. No, I'm generally quite impressed with all you of are, them. You're impressed, okay. So have you, uh, as the president, head of the business roundtable, I assume you've had to deal with presidents of the United States. I assume you haven't said that about how they became president, but um, so um, do you have to, do you have dealt with President Trump or President Biden very much or? Yeah, I, I um, you know, when I first got this role, I interacted with President Obama, then President Trump, then, then right. now President Biden. And I think it's important for a company, you know, we're a highly regulated company. Right. So I think it's important to have a, a good relationship and, you know, from a bipartisan perspective, we're gonna work with every administration. Of those three, who was the smartest? I don't know, David, you'd probably be better at judging uh, that than me. I'm not gonna answer that question, but uh, so um, do you spend a lot of time meeting with members of Congress as well? I do, I do. I mean, again, it's important for them to understand our issues. We have operations in so many states across this company, and then we have dealers in every state. We have a lot of retirees. And so it's important for many members to know our business. All right, if one of the president, whoever's president of the United States at any given time said, Mary, you've done a great job at General Motors, 10 years, now you should be a cabinet secretary. Uh, your response would be? I love what I do now. So you don't want to come in? Yeah, I, again, my passion is General Motors. We're okay. in the middle of the, one of the right. a generational transformation. Suppose somebody said you'd be a great candidate to be a senator or governor for Michigan. Any interest in that? Less than zero. Less than zero. <laughs> wow, okay. Okay, so you're not on a candidate. Just, okay. That's not, that's not in my... Not, not, not in okay. My, so what do you do for relaxation or when you can't be the CEO of General Motors every hour, you must do you go on walks or do you drive your competitor's cars or are you a golfer, a tennis player? What do you do? Uh, you know, I, I try to get exercise in. I, I love to walk. walk um, I'm, I'm a horrible golfer trying to get a little better. Don't have enough time to really do that. So, and it's spending time with family. I have two grown children. I love to spend time with them. So that's, that. and then I, I do believe in retail therapy. Okay, and uh, particularly in the car area, right? Uh, I'm wide open. Okay, okay so today, um, are you uh, convinced that General Motors is now firmly back on the path to being a very strong company for the future? It had its problems years ago. We know about bankruptcy and so forth. But now, uh, you would say that fin financially, it's in pretty good shape? Uh, absolutely. You know, we have, uh, I, again, I think we have a, a very sound strategy to lead in the future across autonomy, electric vehicles. Uh, we also have uh, an investment grade balance sheet and uh, we have a great team. So I'm very, I, I'm very excited about what the future holds. And I do believe that General Motors is strong and is going to be in a leadership position for years. Now, everybody's talking about artificial intelligence these days. And I assume you must have a lot of artificial intelligence being uh, used in various parts of General Motors. So how is it changing your business or how do you think it will change it? it? It already is. I mean, you know, across design, engineering, manufacturing, how we sell um, motorsports, uh, there's artificial intelligence uh, across all of these areas. And, you know, we have teams dedicated because I think it makes the business more efficient. I think we can, uh, you know, make sure we're reaching the customer where they are. So across the board, I think it's gonna drive efficiencies and make us better. Okay, so let's suppose I, looking 10 years down the road, 10 years from today, what, how will a car be different than it is today? If electric or internal combustion, if they're still around in 10 years, what will be in a car that would be even more exciting than whatever's in a car today? I think one of the greatest opportunities within 10 years is the vehicle having the opportunity to be a, to be a personal autonomous vehicle. So yes, you love to drive, but if, you know, if you're 
you've gone to dinner with a friend and you've had you know a couple glasses of wine you're, the vehicle can drive you home and you know there are no autonomous vehicles on the road today that really meet the standard of what i would call level 4 uh, there's you know ride share applications that we you know we have and will have running again but there's no per, you know no uh, personal owned vehicle that is fully autonomous. I think that's a game changer from a safety perspective. Also think about people who can't drive today for, for whatever reason uh, that have uh, uh, disabilities. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think it's that's a huge technology that's gonna open it up for people who don't have the opportunity to drive today. People can drive longer and, uh, or, you know, get to where they want. And because if you go back a hundred years, what made the vehicle auto business so special, and you kind of said it, people couldn't wait, it's freedom. Having the freedom to go where you want to go. So giving people who, for whatever reason, can't drive today, that freedom, I think is exciting. So have you ever been in an autonomous vehicle and sitting there when there's nobody in the driver's seat and do you have a crash helmet on or what? You, no, I, I have mean, many times, many you times. You have, and it's, you feel safe? Yep, just wear my seatbelt. And not just one seatbelt, that's all you need? I mean, I'm thinking more. So, just just okay. a standard seatbelt. Uh, and do you think General Motors is, uh, uh, even with the other people who are producing autonomous vehicles, in other words, they're all probably going to come into the market in the next three, four, five years, or are you ahead or behind the others who are trying I think to do this? We're, I think we're in a, in a very strong position with just a few, a few you know, leading com competitors. I think we're very much in the top group. Okay, so the future of the automobile industry, you think, is, is pretty good for American companies. You're not worried about, there used to be people were obsessed with the Japanese, the Germans manufacturing all the cars and maybe the Chinese, but you think there will always will be, or at least for foreseeable future, American-based manufacturers producing cars in America. Well, I absolutely do, and I think it's very important. I think a, a proof point of that was during the pandemic. I mean, within 30 days, we started building ventilators because we know how to make things. And so when, and also when you think about if there's not strong American companies uh, doing this, the R and D's not there. And so much of the technology we do and, and the, what the vehicle's becoming is really a national security issue. You know, when you look at the CHIPS Act, we, we realized through um, everything that happened with COVID, we need to have manufacturing, we need to have diverse supply chains. And so I think having a strong US base where the R and D is done in this country is important for innovation, national security and jobs. So if somebody's watching and says, I want to be Mary Barra, I'm a young woman, uh, and I want her as a, she's a role model, what are the things that you would tell a young woman who is interested in going in the automobile industry or any manufacturing industry um, that they should have? What qualities should they have? Well, one is study math and science, because I think too often in middle school, young, young girls shy away from math and science. So don't shy, lean in. Uh, and I think that's vitally important. And then what we see, and this is not just in the auto industry, but it's an industry in general, a lot of times women in their early in their career say no, you know, if they, they look at a job opportunity and there's 10 requirements and they say, well, I've only got, uh, you know, nine out of 10, I can't apply. Uh, generally a man will say, I've got six out of 10, I'm gonna go for it. And my message to women is go for it. You know, because even if you don't get that particular job, you're going to learn, you're going to learn about interviewing, you're going to have more experience. So I would say, and then my, my third is have a point of view. Sometimes I, you know, I find women will hold back in meetings and they'll, you know, they'll be thinking and you, you, you know, have a point of view, even if, you know, you're not always going to be right. You're not always going to be what the decision is, but don't be afraid to have a point of view. Okay. So you have two children. Do either of them want to be in the automobile industry? Uh, unfortunately, no. No, I have a daughter who wants to be in the policy arena f focused on education, and my son is a biomedic biomedical engineer and is works for in predictive health. So uh, they, they have their career paths, that, but of course they're in their 20s, so that could change over time. So um, normally uh, in the country, the average CEO of a publicly traded company is in that position for between three and four years, um, unless they're the person who built the company. Um, so you've been in it for 10 years. So have you any thoughts about how much longer you would like to do this? Well, of course, I serve at the pleasure of the board, but again, this is- So you're the chairman of the board, so- uh... Uh, but, there's, but there's 12 other members, right. David. Okay. Uh, but no, I, um, you know, I, I, have a, I have a great board, but um, I'm just, this is such an exciting time. And this is our, you know, in the next couple of years, it's our years to really execute this new strategy. So I'm energized. So for the foreseeable future, you're going to be the CEO and chairman of the board of General Motors, and you're very happy with that, right? Again, uh, as long as I have the opportunity to do that and as we're uh, you know, advancing where okay. we're at, I, it's great. So the final question, if I wanted to go buy a car today, mm -hmm. uh, 
and let's suppose I want a medium price car, uh, what car would you recommend that I buy? Let's assume you recommend a General Motors car, but what would be, given my personality and, and uh, situation, <laughs> what, would be a, what would be a good car for well, me? Well, do you want a truck, a crossover? You want, you want speed? You want performance? Do you want to haul things? What do you want to do? I want everything. <laughs> then I'd get a Hummer. A Hummer. Yeah, I don't know if my children would see me in a Hummer, but uh, I would probably crash it right away. But Mary, uh, you've been a very good sport. You've done a great job. Thank you for what you've done for the Business Roundtable and for Duke University and for the shareholders of General Motors. And thank you for being here today. And I thank have a you gift very for you. much. Thank you. Second. Um, I have a. We'll send this. We'll send this to your office. It's a historic map of the District of Columbia. Okay.